Hey guys, welcome to the Girl Take No Podcast. I am your host, Shani Sanders. And today we have a really good show, especially for us women that are over 40 and we're getting ready to kind of go into that menopause stage. So today I have with me Allison Blythe. She is a registered nutritional therapist. Um, she specialized in globally in helping women manage the negative symptoms of menopause. Allison, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much. It's, it's a pleasure to be here on your podcast today. Thank you for having me. Yes, I, I am, as I told you before, I'm so ready to have this conversation because um, I'm at that age. And it's so funny when I think about menopause, I said to my doctor when I went, I said, you know, you know, I feel, you know, when do we get into that premenopausal stage? You know, because I'm, a, you know, soon I'm going to hit menopause. He said, you're already in it. And I was like, and this is when I was like 45. He was like, you're already in it. And I was like, what? <laughs> I'm already in it. He's like, yeah, people think it's a certain age. I feel like we think it's an age that you hit. And then that's when menopause start. When really my doctor's like, no, it's a range. It starts at a certain age and it's a range. You're not just like, oh, you hit 40 and all of a sudden it's on. No. So I'm glad we're having this show because I have questions. I know my listeners are going to really benefit this since all my listeners are women, um, you know, in that 40, in that age range for like either premenopause or menopause. So welcome. I'm excited. Before we jump into it, I know I just said a lot. Before we jump into it, um, give me the story behind the brand. Tell me what made you become a registered nutritional therapist. Yeah, um, my story actually, or my journey started when I was quite young, and my fascination for hormones started in my teenage years because I actually had mm. very bad, you know, puberty that can actually affect your skin quite badly and you can develop acne. So I had very bad acne from a young age and that in itself is tough, isn't it? It affects your confidence, etc. And I decided that I didn't want to just yeah. take medication. I really wanted to understand what was happening. So that kind of stemmed me down the nutrition, the lifestyle route. And what when I started working, when I, when I was in my 20s, I actually trained to be an esthetician. Uh, because of my interest in skin and hormones, that, mm. that led me to being an esthetician. So I am actually a qualified esthetician and I worked uh, with women with hormonal skin issues initially. And that led me into a group of, of ladies that, that were the perimenopausal menopausal group because, you know, you have problems with your skin or may have problems mm -hmm. with your skin in puberty, but that can really happen also when we, we get into, you know, perimenopause and menopause. I very soon came to realize that you can't just work on the outside, you need to work on the inside. You know, you need the nutritional part for overall health and for skin health. So that's when I went back to university and, and studied nutritional science. And really, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by hormones and the effect that they have on the body. And myself going through perimenopause, yeah. all my family members really struggling. And it was an area that I thought, why aren't we talking about this? You know, menopause isn't really spoken about, is it, that much? And I think a lot of women, exactly as you were saying, that no, no it's not. I'm not in perimenopause. And a lot, a lot of my clients, that they, even if they're having like, the classic symptoms, they still don't relate it to being in menopause. They're like, no, 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 no. I, possibly can't be a menopause I'm far too young so you know that <laughs> yeah that, that was yeah <laughs> dense story of, of how I got into you know what I'm doing doing now <laughs> that that's so true because that's what I, I think about I'm like no that's not part of that because I spoke to one of my friends recently and she said you know I'm having hot flashes and I said girl no you're not you're way too young to be having hot flashes you're not there yet so in my mind I always thought like menopause I never even thought about perimenopause right so I definitely want you to define that for our audience and menopause as well but I always thought oh well you, you'll get menopause you'll hit menopause when you hit 50 I always thought it was just that never knew that it was actually could start before that symptoms can start before that so explain to my audience um what is perimenopause yeah great question because a lot of people don't truly understand what what this is what what you want to think of with menopause it's a transition mm -hmm. and perimenopause is the beginning of the transition and it's a very individual journey for every woman it can start at 40 
on, on average, it starts at the age of 45, but it is very individual. Actually, one in every hundred women mm -hmm. will have men before the age of 40. You know, there's there's reasons uh, that that women go into menopause, even you know, at very young ages. Whether it's to do with you know illnesses, uh, cancer treatment, hysterectomies, etc. You know, so that so there are women that really go through this when they're younger. But if we look at the the natural menopausal process, perimenopause mm -hmm. is where things start to become a bit unsettled. Uh, average age forty five, but. You know, you can see, I see with my clients that in early 40s, they can show symptoms of, of perimenopause. Oestrogen and progesterone levels, which are the, the female sex hormones, they really start to kind of become a bit unbalanced. That It's a bit like a roller coaster. I like to liken uh, oestrogen yeah. to the demon and progesterone to the calming best friend. Because what happens in perimenopause is oestrogen levels actually can become quite high. So you can suffer from uh, oestrogen dominance. And progesterone is like the calming hormone. But normally the progesterone would balance mm. out the oestrogen, whereas in perimenopause it doesn't do that. So, you know, the diva, the, the oestrogen could get a bit overexcited and, you know, one minute you can be hysterically happy and the next minute you can, you know, be crying in the corner. And the calming best friend <laughs> isn't there to say, you know, everything's going to be okay. So, but you're yeah. still menstruating in perimenopause and you, you're still fertile. Mm. It's just that things become unbalanced. And that leads to the, you know, the classic menopausal symptoms like hot flashes, weight gain, mm -hmm. hair loss, itchy skin. I mean, mood, the list goes on. There's about 40 different menopausal symptoms. Perimenopause mm. lasts roughly to the age of 51. Again, it's very individual. Mm. And then you actually go into menopause. Now, menopause is when you haven't had a period for a year. So when you haven't menstruated for a year, you are actually in what we call menopause. Uh, and then all the time after menopause is what we call postmenopause. The so menopause really is, that, is really actually only one day. It's the day after not having a period oh. for a year and then post-menopause which is the rest of a, a woman's life and i mean we're living a lot longer now I mean, it could be 30 plus years yeah wow i didn't know that that menopause actually happened one day you know and that's when the day after your period starts and now and then that's post-menopause that is so wow you just listen i've just been educated on a lot of this <laughs> You know, I think about menopause. I remember seeing my mom. I didn't know what it was then. I think I was young. I'm the youngest of 12 kids. And I didn't really know what it was at that time. But she was always really hot. And she was really having a really hard time um, from what she told me going through menopause. Why do women have such a hard time going through menopause? I mean, it's such this thing of like, when you go through menopause, get ready. I mean, some women really suffer through it. What do you think that is? Because, I mean, it really makes a lot of us afraid, you know what I mean, to step into that menopause or premenopausal stages. It's so, it's so individual. I mean, there's some women that just glide through mm. menopause, really don't have any symptoms at all. And, you know, one day they don't have a period and, and they think, oh, oh, okay, now I'm in postmenopause. But I think it, there's a small amount of genetics attached to it. But there are the, also that I see with my clients that uh, the health that you're in when you go into perimenopause can play or have a factor in how you're, you experience menopause. So, you know, if you're, um, <laughs> well, I don't like to use the word unhealthy, but, you know, if you're not maybe looking after yourself as well as you should mm -hmm. in, your, in your younger yeah. years, when you come into uh, menopause, then you may experience symptoms worse. I mean, weight management is, is very key in, in menopause. And it's actually shown in studies that, you know, if you're mm -hmm. carrying more weight, then you may experience the menopausal symptoms worse, you know. So I think it's, you know, just mm. look, looking after yourself. That's good to know. Yeah, when you come into menopause, yeah. it's really 
it's a time that you need to take care of yourself even more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to ask that. Is it steps that we can take as women, like, you know, like before even the premenopausal stages? Okay, are there steps to say, hey, start eating differently start doing this you know there's so many different you know a lot of people saying about probiotics you know start taking probiotics and stuff like that um is that are there steps that we can take are there steps right now that i can start taking before i move into the full menopause stage i think again it's what we have to remember is that estrogen is this is not just a sex hormone it the estrogen is a it's so it's what we call a master hormone and it's very important for metabolic health you know mm -hmm. metabolism our overall health and bone health heart health uh, there's also now research coming out a possible link between estrogen and dementia so brain health so you, we really want to mm -hmm. look hard for ourselves and a very good way to start before you even go into perimenopause is you know thinking about what you eat um, a Mediterranean yeah. style diet, which has been shown in, in research to come out tops as, as a very good way of eating, uh, especially for menopausal women or pre, you know, when we're not actually in perimenopause. And what does that mean? It's really a diet mm -hmm. that um, is low on sugary, refined, processed foods. It's got what we call whole foods. Uh, good sources of protein, healthy fats. There's, there's nothing wrong with fat. We need fat for the production of hormones mm -hmm. and many other processes in the body. But fats like uh, avocado, uh, olive oil, nuts and seeds, you know, all those wonderful healthy fats we need. Mm -hmm. and, and really looking at eating vegetables, you know, we need fibre. Uh, one key thing for women, especially when you were going into perimenopause and also before that is that we need to eliminate what we call we need to detoxify estrogens so when our body has utilized estrogens it mm. eliminates them. and if you don't eliminate them correctly they are then reabsorbed back into the system and these estrogens that are reabsorbed aren't the same uh, as the estrogens that you have in your body and they can cause estrogen dominance and, and other uh, effects that we don't want on the body so a very good way to make sure your body's eliminating mm -hmm. these old estrogens is to eat uh, crucivus vegetables they're, they're wonderful things like broccoli uh, cauliflower cabbage brussels sprouts they're mm -hmm. really fantastic for women's hormonal health and all the uh, wonderful fiber rich seeds and nuts. We, we need to keep our digestion moving. We don't want our body reabsorbing anything. It's kind of like you, you want to take the trash out, don't you? You don't want that uh, waste staying yeah. in your body because it will start to reabsorb it. So eating fiber rich foods is really important for, for women's hormonal health to really keep the digestion you know moving like it should that's good to know do you think um do you suggest like women i guess who are going maybe experiencing really hard times with um menopause do you suggest any medication for them or do you believe that we can do things more of a natural way through our eating through our you know our exercising and really just taking care of our bodies I, I, I'm a nutritional therapist, so I'm, I'm not obviously a doctor. You know, I work alongside doctors. I'm what we call a complementary yeah. practitioner. However, you know, women come to me and they're, they're, most of the women that come to me are very overwhelmed and, you know, they're, they're feeling terrible. And, you know, I'm, I'm very, we have to look at this. In, in There's lots of different factors that come into play. And when we talk about menopause, uh, we, we, you know, we look at hormone replacement therapy which would be prescribed by a doctor if, if that is suitable for the person. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I think hormone replacement therapy has a place, absolutely. It's not for everyone and it is quite a controversial subject, but it certainly mm -hmm. can help many women. But you can't just 
take hormone replacement therapy and forget about your nutrition and your lifestyle you really it's it's all these different factors yeah you know hormone replacement therapy good nutrition lifestyle mindset they, they all come into play to make you feel better through through this process and there is i don't know what it's like in in your part of the world but in europe where, where i'm living there's a bit of a menopause revolution going on here and, and women, a lot of celebrities have gone behind it. And they've done documentaries and and women are just, mm-hmm. it's, it's amazing how the effect that that's had. Because everybody's talking about menopause and everybody's talking about hormone replacement therapy. And I think, not you know, knowledge is power, isn't it? And, and women are really, yeah. the knowledge, once they've got everything in front of them, then they themselves can make an informed decision about what is correct for them. But I think, you know, don't rule out anything until you understand. And maybe that that can actually help. Yeah, I, I, you know, I agree with you. Like knowledge is definitely power. I do agree that, you know, it seems that we're seem to be talking a lot more about menopause now because before I think people felt like, oh, that's our older woman's problem. You know what I mean? That's an older woman thing. We don't need to talk about that. We have years before that. But I think it's something that, I know I need to educate myself more into, especially because I'm in that, that, that I'm in that zone now, <laughs> that age range. And I, and I think it's important to have that information. When do you suggest a woman start educating herself on premenopause, menopause, just to begin to understand what it is, what the body is actually going to start to go through um, and what steps to take to kind of help you through it. When do you think we should start doing that? Well, I think really, I mean, it, it, it's every single woman will go through menopause and mm. it's it's ridiculous that we don't talk about it. I mean, really, if you think like, like yeah. I remember my mother spoke to me, you know, about the birds and the bees and, and what would happen when you had your first menstruation and, and all of that. But no one ever told me about menopause. Mm-hmm. You know, I think maybe in, in within the family, yep. that, that the women uh, members should talk to i mean maybe it's not something you need to know about when you're a teenager because you've, you've got enough going on then haven't you with all mm-hmm. your hormones but you know in, in your 20s <laughs> yeah. it's very important that that we understand as women so we can we can empathize also with with women that are going through it i know that there's mm-hmm. they've been talking in in europe about maybe having a you know a section when the, in education in the schools that they will talk about you know the different phases and maybe focus a little bit more on perimenopause and menopause so the people are made aware of yeah. it at a younger age at schooling age so yeah yeah I, I think that's important too i think it's important to talk about it as you know, like you said, in school age, especially when you're in your 20s, just to know that this is what's coming. And so you can be prepared, you can be knowledgeable in it and know how to handle it. But when it comes to the mood control, how do one, how do you deal with the moods? Um, I have a friend who had a certain type of surgery and they said that, hey, this surgery can throw you into um, early menopause when she was already in the premenopause ages because we're the same age. But she's begin now to experience these different moves where she's feeling, she said to me the other day where she feels somewhat down. You know, she's just been very emotional and she couldn't understand what it was until she remembered that from the surgery that she had, they say that, hey, this can actually, that she had on her ovaries, that, hey, this can actually throw you into menopause or either early stage or premenopause. And so how do you tell someone, or how do you help someone deal with the mood swings that come with menopause? Yeah, that's such a big area and it's difficult isn't it i mean i know my, my i'm in perimenopause and my myself and yeah that's something that i've really noticed that i have less tolerance and and, and get really irritated over things that never mm-hmm. used to bother me but and what what happens is with estrogen yeah again estrogen, we have estrogen receptors all over the body uh and in the brain so when our levels start to decline, also progesterone as well, you know, it affects the brain, it affects our moods, it affects what we call our happy hormones, hormones like dopamine, serotonin, <laughs> oxyto- oxytocin, all those hormones that 
Well, they have many functions of uh, neurotransmitters that really affect how we feel. Uh, and I think the first way to handle this is really to accept that, you know, I'm not going crazy. There is a reason that I feel like this. Mm -hmm. And maybe talking to the, the members of your family or your, you know, people that are close to you to say, if I am, you know, anxious or, or moody or whatever, then please, you know, try to understand that this is a phase in my life that I'm going through and it's due to hormones yeah. or uh, but there's obviously other factors that can come into play but eating uh going back to nutrition uh foods in balance and regulating blood sugar is key for for many things but it's very important for mood control uh because when we eat mm -hmm. a, a diet high in sugary refined foods that basically shoots our blood sugar up um and when you have higher yeah. blood sugar levels, you, you produce insulin, which is a hormone that, that allows your body to utilize the sugar. But if you're constantly eating these, these sugary foods, it can really, it, again, it becomes like a roller coaster. And this can cause like anxiety and, and irritability and, and mood, moodiness. So really thinking about what you eat mm -hmm. is crucial and, and gut health is, is crucial for how we feel. You know, the gut and the brain are, are yeah. work together, they're connected. Yeah, yeah, that's true. What is like, because um, I know also when you hear people talk about menopause, you talk, they talk about how your, your intimacy and your um, sex drive begin to diminish there as well. What can a woman do when it comes to that aspect of menopause? Like, how do you, you know, I know there's things out there where to help you kind of regain your sex drive, but what is that like for women in menopause? What is intimacy? What can they expect from that? Yeah, that is an area that I think a lot of people, we need absolutely to talk about this more because a lot of women are really suffering. Yeah. Uh, through menopause, your mm -hmm. mucous membranes dry, can become drier. You know, the, the eyes, the nose, the vagina. And a lot of women suffer from vaginal dryness, mm -hmm. which can be really painful. And obviously, if you're, if you're having, you know, mm -hmm. if it's hurting, you're not going to want to have intimacy. You're not, you're not going to be wanting any sort of intimacy with your partner. One thing about vaginal dryness is that it is so easy to treat you you would need to go to your doctor but mm -hmm. there's gels estrogen gels um that are really effective in this area and they're not systemic so they don't you know there's the trials that have been done on them they don't go into the system so even if you maybe for whatever reason can't use hormone replacement therapy uh the the gels the estrogen gels that you can use uh, for the vaginal area don't go out into the system and they really are very effective so any woman that is mm -hmm. really suffering from that ask for help because there's there really are very efficient ways to to do that and also um you know things like i think again talking to your partner and trying to explain mm -hmm. what is going on um but horm hormones the testosterone is, is also being spoke about a lot at the moment because um, mm -hmm. testosterone is when it's not just through menopause our testosterone levels decline as we age mm -hmm. and testosterone is a hormone that is, is uh, shown to help with libido uh, so you know that can be something that you could talk to your doctor about because with you know lack of intimacy lack of libido or, or lack of sex drive it could be testosterone levels that, that are low. Uh, so, you you know, you can, I don't know what it's like where you are, but in Europe, it's, it's, it's quite difficult with testosterone. It's not licensed for women yet. Mm -hmm. uh, it'd be a bit tricky with that, but, and there is, there is more need research needed in this area, but testosterone plays a big part in, in libido. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do you, can you say that, I guess we've come a long way in terms of being able to better understand what menopause is, better understanding what maybe what products or what things that we can do to help us, you know, get through it and not get through, but manage it. 
because we'll be in it for the rest, you know, I guess post-menopause for the rest of our lives, as you said. And being able to manage it there and you know i see there's so many different products out there now coming out about helping women with menopause helping with vaginal dryness um i just interviewed a woman on my show the other day and they have products that really help with that and help with women going into the menopause and so can you say that we've come a long way in terms of like the technology the information and the treatment around menopause yes i think if you compare um I mean, the era that I grew up in, that, that menop- mm-hmm. there was relatively nothing. And yeah. I'm sure you've heard about the, the study called the Women's Initiative Study mm-hmm. that, that was came out, that it, I think it was in the, t- the early 2000s. Uh, it was in the 1999, to, uh, <laughs> round about then. And this really put hormone replacement therapy in a very negative light. And mm-hmm. that's, it's a very long story behind that, but basically it was reported incorrectly. But because of the headlines that came out from this research, you know, a vast majority of women came off hormone replacement therapy mm-hmm. uh, because they were scared, rightly so. But what we found out now that it, that wasn't necessarily the case, that, that, that the hormones that were given them were, were from uh, horses' urine. It was from mares. Uh, whereas it, when we look at hormone replacement therapy now, it comes from uh, yams. You know, so in its majority of obviously there's different sorts, but some of them are what we call body identical. Mm. So it's actually the same as the, the hormones in, in your body. So things have changed a lot. However, it, there, there is more research needed on women. Women research on women in general is mm-hmm. very, very. Uh, we need to understand more. We've, we've yeah. got the resources there, but we don't fully understand many things yet. And I think for us to be confident and, and you know, in, in recommending um, treatments, et cetera, we need to have the evidence to, to behind it, really, to, to back that up. So it's much better, but it has got quite a long way to go still. Yeah. Why is it that women are still not being, I guess, researched as much, especially in this area? Why do you think we're we're still not, you know, getting whatever research we need to better help women in this area? I think research on women, um, it, it's because if you think we have, we're when we have our monthly cycles, you know, there's a lot going on, isn't there, in a woman's body mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. all the time, whereas men are much more stable. You know, there's yeah. so many, when we're doing research on, I mean, and I'm not saying that this should be a reason that we don't, but I think it's easier to do research on men. Yeah. You know, w- women, you have to take into all the factors of what time of the month is it and what are her hormone levels, etc. I think that <clears throat> is one of the factors. It makes things more complicated. But I mean, that isn't, a, it should still be done on women because we, yeah. <clears throat> when it comes to medications, you know, we, we, we need to see how these medications affect women. Men and women's bodies are very different. You mm-hmm. know, you can't just say if you've tested a certain medication on a man, you know, how do we know that that is going to be okay on a woman's body? So exactly. There's certainly a huge lack in, in research on women, unfortunately. Let me ask you this, because I have heard this numerous times. I actually had a family member where birth after menopause or birth during menopause um i have an aunt who actually had two kids during menopause which i was like i thought you couldn't have kids anymore once you're in menopause you're like done so what what are your thoughts on that like because that was very shocking to me when she had two more kids during menopause was she in perimenopause? Because I mean, when you're in perimenopause, you're you're still fertile. If things get a bit unbalanced, <laughs> you're still. You know what? Maybe she was in perimenopause because I just know my my. my I think my mother called them. Um, they had a term for them. It's just a very old country term. I think a uh, certain afterlife baby, something something life babies. And she was well. Maybe she was in perimenopause because my thing is that if you're in menopause or your post-menopause, or if you haven't had a period for a year, can you still get pregnant or 
is that this and this is my mind asking this question because I'm just so I'm wondering this because I've had conversations about this too. Is it possible to still get pregnant even though if you haven't had a period for a year? I mean, if you're in post menopause, that means that you are no longer ovulating. You're mm -hmm. no longer having periods, and, and your estrogen and progesterone levels have declined very. You know, they're very low. So. You know, no, yeah. I, I would not say that you would be able to get pregnant. But however, in perimenopause, absolutely. And you hear of women, you know, mm -hmm. when they're in for late 40s that think, oh, no, I couldn't possibly get pregnant. And then all of a sudden, you know, that this <laughs> baby comes along. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the baby comes along and you're just surprised. <laughs> yeah. So, like, be careful because... You can absolutely get pregnant in perimenopause. As long as you're having periods, you can get pregnant because you're still ovulating. But when you, when you haven't yeah. had a period in a year and you're not ovulating, uh, no. Yeah, okay. Because, you know, I think about Janet Jackson, and this is just me, like I said. And I'm like, I know she's in her 50s, and she had a baby. And I'm just like, well, she did definitely freeze her eggs, so she was able to do that. But... I was just like, well, how is she able to, is she not, maybe she's not in menopause yet. Maybe she's just in premenopause because it's like, how was she able to have a kid at her age? That is okay. That's something to be wondered. That's bewildering to me. <laughs> I don't know. You know, I'm just trying to figure it out. Okay. Um, so nutrition, like you said, so you've been talking a lot about nutrition plays a huge part in men and premenopause and actually doing the menopause stages right so what are some i think you mentioned some too but what are still some of those foods that we can eat, start eating now to say hey let's start taking in more of this let's start taking in more of that people are always talk about blackberries and you know all these different things so you hear so much you know because there's so much information out there and you hear so much as women are like what you need to be eating kind of give us a few things and also is there somewhere on your website or is there when you're taking clients, you give them a list and say, hey, this is a list of things that you need to be eating to help you through this stage. Yeah, nutrition is, is such a huge area when it comes to menopause. But what, like I was saying, Mediterranean <laughs> diet, there's actually on my, my website under the resources page mm -hmm. that there's a, an ebook with chopping lists and recipes on a Mediterranean style diet. So if anyone wants to get more ideas about that. Oh, we need good. To look at, yeah, I'm we need to that. look at <laughs> our gut. Um, so there's many different areas that we need to look after coming into menopause. And the gut health, um, the microbiome, which is what we call our gut bacteria. So we really need to eat things like mm -hmm. fermented foods, fermented foods like sauerkraut, uh, kimchi, fermented vegetables, mm, you know, all, you. all those fermented foods are what we call probiotics. And they, they contain th these wonderful gut mm -hmm. bugs that our digestive tract likes. So probiotics are very helpful. And one thing that it sounds very basic, but a lot of people don't do it, is to drink enough water. You really need to keep yourself hydrated. Mm-hmm. And we all know that, really, don't we? But do we actually really drink the amount yeah. of water that we should? Uh, so hydration yeah. is, is really key. And protein. Uh, protein is so important. I and mean, it becomes even more important when you get older as a woman because you lose muscle mass and you also, um, your risk of uh, developing osteoporosis, which is when your bones become more porous, goes up due to the lack of estrogen yeah. we need estrogen for bone health so really we don't in general eat enough protein protein is the building blocks of the body so things like chicken yeah. fish you know all meats if, if you don't eat meat things like soya products nuts and seeds um a palm size of protein with every meal really is what you need and and that also keeps you satisfied so you find if you're if you're eating enough protein you you won't actually eat as much because you you, you feel full of the longer uh all the lovely berries mm -hmm. like blueberries are, are wonderful and fruit is great but fruit also contains fructose and we just have to be a little bit careful with sugar 
but I'm not yeah. saying you shouldn't eat fruit because fruit is wonderful and it's got fiber and many nutrients in it but if you stick more to berries you know like blueberries blackberries raspberries strawberries they don't have um what we call such a the glycemic index which is the way that foods affect your blood sugar you know they're lower on that so you can eat those sorts of fruits things like apples and pears mm -hmm. as well are better fruits uh, for, for regarding the sugar content and then things, you know, really looking at the fat that you're eating in your diet. Try to avoid, I know it's difficult. It really, you know, I'm very realistic when I give suggestions because we're living in a, a food environment that is very difficult to navigate, isn't it? You know, there's food everywhere yeah. you go. And unfortunately, the food that we see yeah. is normally highly refined processed food. Try to avoid buying foods in, in packages that have a mass of ingredients on the back because they're not really very nutritious. Yeah. Some of these highly processed foods are, are, are devoid of nutrition and, and they cause inflammation. They have damaged oils in them. So really looking at what you eat and being mindful and healthy fats. Olive oil is fabulous. Extra virgin organic olive oil is so wonderful for the body. You know, you can have it on salads, um, you know, mm -hmm. just sprinkle a little bit of foods. Preferably don't cook with olive oil. It should really be used cold on, on foods because it can, what you have to think oh. about when you're cooking uh, is the type of fats and what they call the burn point of fats. Because if you heat uh, fats up to, some fats too high, they, they burn and they, it changes the chemical composition of them. Um, so olive oil is okay if you're only cooking on very mm. low heat. But if you're really going to grill something, then you know, you, you're better off using butter or, or coconut oil or ghee uh, because they have a higher, what we'd say, burn point. Mm. So fat, fats, incorporating fats into your yeah. diet is really important. And then thinking about whole grains um you know thinking about the carbohydrates that you eat that there's nothing wrong with carbohydrates again it's the sort of carbohydrates i mean vegetables are carbohydrates and you know we all should be eating mm -hmm. vegetables. they're just wonderful for our health so really thinking about when you look at your plate you should have protein you should have healthy fats really half of your plate should be vegetables you know leafy greens salads etc you don't need to have half your plate full of like potatoes or, or rice. Really try and fill up on vegetables <laughs> and <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Because I was just gonna ask, like, what about like breads and wheat breads and rice and you know the the seven grain, the twelve grain type of breads. Are those breads pretty good for too, the grains, the twelve and seven grains? Or is it still not the best carb to have there's nothing wrong with i think bread's been demonized hasn't it a bit like potatoes and, and the, there's nothing wrong yes. with potatoes <laughs> it's, if, we, if we look at a potato it, there's nothing wrong with a potato but it's what we do to it isn't it i mean if you're going to just have a, a potato <laughs> but the fact that we deep fry it and we cover it in in all these like oily fatty sauces uh you know, we we make them unhealthy, whereas a potato actually is very high in, in many nutrients. Uh, it's the same with bread. I think there's so much choice of bread, isn't there? Now we we we, we mm -hmm. we've become aware that bread maybe is a carbohydrate that that increases our blood sugar. I don't think there's anything wrong with bread, but I would say to eat it in moderation because it does it can have an effect on your on your blood sugar and it's there's other things mm -hmm. that are more nourishing you know if you want carbohydrates but things like rye breads and, and the seed breads really try to uh buy breads that have mm -hmm. a high fiber content uh, because that that will avoid the 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 high yeah. blood sugar like white bread is the worst you know the refined grains that, that i mean they just yeah straight mm -hmm. system and shoot sugar up so they're really more 
wholemeal breads. So, I mean, if anyone's really uh, likes baking, obviously making your own bread is, is uh, fantastic. Sourdough bread is, is very good and, and lovely mm. if you enjoy making that at home. You know, I, I think you're probably the second nutritionist. And I think, first of all, we need to start listening to more nutritionists <laughs> versus just people who are like, hey, I'm a workout junkie and don't eat carbs because you're the second nutritionist that are the certified nutritionist that said there's nothing wrong with carbs. You can have some breads. You can have certain things. that, And we really have demonized carbs. Like you said, if you're going to dip them in deep fry them and cover them in all this different stuff, then that's what's wrong with them is what we do to them. And of course the white carbs, but it's good to hear because I think people need to hear that you can have a piece of rye bread. You don't have to have 12 slices. You know what I mean? You could have one, you know, in moderation, but it's good that you said that because I, I feel like we don't, we tell people do a no carb diet. That's how you're going to lose the weight do no carbs, no carbs. Everything is no carbs, no carbs. And people are out here starving. I feel like, Allison, I feel yeah. like people are starving because they are hungry. <laughs> yeah. I totally agree with you. And oh I mean, my goodness. Like everything in moderation. I mean, we have to be realistic. I think if you're going to be very restrictive about what you eat, it, it won't last long term. And, you know, eating healthy, for nourishment exactly it's, it's a life, lifestyle isn't it it's, it's not something that you can just do for a couple of months so mm -hmm. don't, can't, there's nothing wrong with carbohydrates it's just the sort of carbohydrate and you know in the moderation but the carbohydrates are fine mm -hmm. I, I think there's a lot you know if we think about in the 70s there was suddenly there's oh no uh, we can't eat fat and, and all of a sudden, everything became fat-free, didn't it? Totally. Yes. You know, the, yes. the, the, the fat was demonized. And now things have totally kind of turned mm -hmm. around due to the research. And now we're saying, actually, that, that really wasn't correct what we said. Now we can eat fat as long as it's the healthy fat. And, <laughs> well, it's yeah. a moving science, isn't it, nutrition? It, it, it changes. Our knowledge changes quite regularly with the research that, that comes out. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, like I said, I think, just think we got to listen to the experts more so than thinking that we got to jump on some new fad that's out that's supposed to really help us lose weight quick. But like you said, it's about what can you do for the long term? What can actually you maintain as a lifestyle? That's what's important. And if you're able to maintain a good lifestyle, then you're able to also help yourself through the perimenopause and the menopause stages of being active and eating good. So I, I like that. And I think we all needed to hear that, that it's okay to have some fats. It's okay to have some carbs. We can eat people. We can eat. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, stop. Oh, oh stop. my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. So listen, Allison, this has been a, a good show. Um, I think we've learned a lot, especially me, uh, when it came to perimenopause and menopause itself, because I still needed to know a lot more about it. And I got to get better on my, even myself, I got to get better with my eating. And I'm definitely going to go to your website and download the ebook and definitely have a list that I can shop with to um, actually start stacking up in the house and kind of changing and shifting my way of, of eating. So I appreciate you for being on the show. I really do. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Um, but before we end the sh yes before we end the show I'm going to ask you a question I ask every guest that comes on my show what was some of the best advice you received from another woman yeah I think it would have to be my wonderful grandmother who she was such a wise lady and I, I remember this and she said she said to me when she was very uh, old and you know didn't have many months left on this planet she said to me live every day as if it was your last and I always remember that mm. and it's something that that I think about a lot because you know aging is a privilege really isn't it not everybody has that privilege yes uh, so mm -hmm. enjoy every day as if it was your last yes 
I like that. Enjoy every day as if it was your last. Now you're right. Aging is a privilege. Some people try to do this whole thing of anti-aging. People don't want to age when aging is a privilege and you age gracefully and you embrace it. So I like that. I like that completely. Um, guys, listen, this was a great show. I really hope you guys learned a lot about menopause, pre-menopause, and just overall knowing that it's your nutrition that really helps you get through it and taking care of your body and being knowledgeable in what's to come. You know, I think that's important to educate yourself on it. Um, I am Shawnee Sanders. This is the Girl Techno Podcast, and we will see you next time.